Hello, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. I normally say good evening, and it is evening for me right now, but we're doing one of our shorts. I am so excited about this because this is something I just said to my fiance. Our topic tonight, it's one of my favorite things in the world. It's actually all I care about. And I actually mean that because it's the foundation um, of the life I've led since I walked through the doors of martial arts. And sometimes it takes me left, sometimes it takes me right, sometimes right down the middle. But I just want to say before we jump in um, with our guest tonight that Hanshi Legacy is the one who introduced me to this topic and keeps me learning. Um, I, I don't even think I heard the word before he said it, or if I did, I don't remember. Uh, and Sensei Dauphin is someone who I've continued that journey with, but who's also physically made me enact the very topic we're discussing. And that'll be clear once uh, he reveals it, um, because you can't avoid this topic when you're uh, defending something that's coming more quickly than you can think. Sensei Dauphin, what am I talking about? And who's our guest tonight? We are tonight going to be talking about Zen and martial arts. And I kind of was joking, said, that's because we're all martial artists. Otherwise, we'd just be talking about Zen because it exists in everything, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Uh, but uh, Sensei Fernet, he's a student of uh, Hunchy Chuck Merriman since 1980. And he was recently in Okinawa to help intern him in uh, in Okinawa, which I think is an amazing thing. Uh, he's made more than uh, 20 stays in Okinawa to train uh, under the technical direction of Master. I'm going to, I'm just going to say Miyazato and then Sensei, you can, I know we're going to talk about him more. Mm -hmm. um, who We were just talking about him. He was a student of uh, Chojin Miyagi, the founder of Goju Karate. Uh, in, in addition uh, to teaching, Sensei Fernet works to promote karate on the international scene uh, guy, by giving demonstrations and seminars all over the world. Um, He's attracted up to 15,000 spectators to some of his demonstrations. And uh, I don't even think I've hit 15,000 in my 35 years. So <laughs> he did it in one shot. Um, um, he's authored a bunch of books, um, more than 15 videos on martial arts. Uh, he's the founder and technical director of Club Karate Boucherville. Uh, he's been practicing karate for more than 40 years. So it's a standing joke with... Uh, uh, since the legacy that you got to be in martial arts for 30 years to not be a quitter. So he's definitely past the, the quitter <laughs> stage. Um, he's a five-time world champion, three-time North American champion, uh, 12-time Canadian champion, and he's won more than 30 international titles. Um, I just want to also say, go ahead and Google his name and eye of the tiger. If you think you can kick like him, you cannot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you cannot kick like Sensei Fernet. Um, and if you can, I want to see proof. Um, I want to see a video of that. Um, um, his name, Sensei Fernet's name is one that I heard about since Lacey often talked about him like way back when I started. That was in 1989. Um, and one of the things I guess I want to say before we get going is from Pitch, Punch Kit Choke Chat, of all, we've met lots of great people, but uh, I feel like you know, from being in Levy and being a Capital Conquest and doing this, that actually I have an actual real relationship with Sensei Fernet. It's not just like uh, he's he's trained my daughters. And one of the things I'll say, uh, both of my daughters are fairly flexible. And if you don't know, Sensei Fernet is fairly flexible. And I'm understating that when I say that the three <laughs> of them are. And uh, so my daughters really like training with him when we go to these events. And uh, we walked up to the mat and they were like laying flat out and said to Fernet stepped onto the mat and he said, look, everybody see these two young ladies. They couldn't even touch their toes until they started working with me last session. And now they're full <laughs> out in the splits. So, um, so he's a very charismatic and fun person. And I'm really to have him on, uh, happy to have him on and us to crack this topic open, which is Zen in the martial arts. <clears throat> Thanks Sensei Dauphin. So Sensei Fernet, um, it's such a pleasure to see you again. And I really did love working with your Capital Conquest and seeing you in person. Um, let's just start. And this way you can start guiding our chat a bit. What the fuck is Zen? This word is bandied about so much. Everybody thinks, you know, especially with the internet, Zen this, Zen that. You've got 20 year olds going, if you want to be Zen, what is Zen? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be with you guys again. And I think about you guys all, uh, many times because I talk to people and they, they're, they're asking, is there like anything like a, like discussions or like a, a forum or whatever? I said, well, just 
go check out the uh, punch kick choke and chat because there's there's so many topics that you guys are covering it's like that's the place to go so uh kudos for all all these these uh these uh you know interviews and uh, how many of them like a hundred and something now uh 30 one, plus yeah Thank yeah you. so so amazing so i, I think it's it's a it's entertaining, but also it's it's a good uh, reference. A reference, you know, like some somebody want, wants to know more about specific topics. You know, it's not just general, but you go in depth into uh, those discussion, and I find it like very uh, uh, not just useful. But I'm trying to find the right word to say what I want to say. But the, it's it's very rich in in terms of uh, of information. So uh, thank you for doing this, and I really appreciate to be back with you guys. And uh, I wish we'd see each other more often, but you know we got we got those events that we that we go to and we bump into each other and we always have a good time. So Zen, are you going to Levy Sensei? Before we are you going to Levy? Are you going to be? I'm Levy? supposed to go. I'm just waiting because I just finished doing the work with on one production, and I'm jumping into uh, Karate Kid. So yeah, they're doing a, another remake with Jackie. So oh. we'll, the schedule is going to go, but in theory, yes, I should be there. So hopefully, yeah. we'll see you there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so here we go. Zen. Zen is being, is being in the moment, you know. So I think that sometimes people, you know, to make it, make it very, very simple. Uh, and it is simple anyway. Uh, that's why people are referring to it like just to be Zen, like be in the moment, be, be you know, that brings that calmness, that, that presence in that moment now. And that's why in Japan, when you, when you look at how uh, everything is Zen in a way where, you know, Let's say you do floral arrangement. Well, you're you're doing this. You're you're that. You're in that moment. You're in that, in that in that uh, activity that you're doing. So that's that's the concept at the base and making it very simple and uh, you know uh, not complicated in terms of try to explain it. But Zen for us, you know, for martial artists, it goes beyond because it's about when I always like it's funny because I was looking at the different kanji, but you have the the term mushin. Right, or you have the term Fudo Shin here on my arm, or Ken Shin. You know, everything, every word like this as the word Shin means the heart, the spirit, um, and everything evolves around that. What who who you are in that moment now, and what you are doing, you're doing it a hundred percent. So that's why it's so important in life, but it's also important in our practice. Because when you fight or you do a kata or you do whatever technique, you cannot be doing this and thinking about something else. You have 100% what we call here and now. So the Zen concept is in, in a small way of describing it. That's what it is. You know, then can you meditate sitting on the chair? Yes. Can you do it like the real way, like in the Zen temple and the lotus or semi-lotus? Of course, it's better. But... There's no limit in terms of, you know, being able to meditate and practice Zen. So, and I call martial art, what we're doing karate is active Zen because you're in the moment now, like you're sitting. If you compare sitting, like I would say, like when I was sitting um, uh, in Okinawa with uh, Sakya Morishi, now he passed away. But he would always say, because he was a martial artist, he, uh, karateka, he was always comparing like Zen and karate. He would say, okay, it's the same concept, posture. Breathing, attention, presence now, in the moment now. It's the same thing as whether you're practicing karate or you're sitting and doing Zen. So the concept is simple in its way, but it's very hard to achieve. And that's why people, you know, some people, they try it and they find it very hard because the mind is always wandering, thinking about, you know, different things and because of the world that we live in and people have their worries and everything else. How do you let go, right? So this is the principle, the basic principle of it, which is about those three things: posture, breathing, and attention, and here and now. So let me ask you something, and then we'll go around the horn on it. Do you have to be consciously on a Zen path? Think about a high-level tennis player who, okay. in the heat of competition, I believe would be in a Zen state. Mm -hmm. They're reactive, they're moving, but they may never have thought of the word. So for one to be Zen, does one need to be consciously on the path or can they be absolutely ignorant of their own Zen? Some people, they're, 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 they're not necessarily aware of this or the, the concept itself, but they're doing it. You know, some people will do it instinctively, you know, 
And that, that's the interesting thing, you know, why people would just instinctively become that, you know, it's because it's, it's, it's part of being human and being living at the moment and not living in the future or in the past. And that's very important. So like you said, like eye level, uh, you know, like sports, sports athletes or like tennis or like uh, Joko or whoever, you know, and when you watch them go, you go, these guys, they don't drop anything because they're so focused. So they're in that moment now. So which is the same as as Zen, you know, as much as some people might say, well, you can't compare Zen to tennis, a tennis player. No, it's not the sport itself is the attitude, the mindset of, of Zen, which just makes a big difference. Right on. I'll throw it to you next, Sensei Dofa. Um, you know, do you want to add any ideas of what is Zen? And do you want to talk about anything to do with how conscious one has to be to achieve it or not? I think if you're conscious of it, then you're not in Zen. <laughs> <laughs> like you're not. Um, and I think uh, Zen exists whether we want it to or not. And I think everybody experiences it, whether they're aware they do or not. Uh, people do things in the moment every day all the time they're just not conscious of it we all did today like i just was talking to Aunt Lacey about this i said like i don't remember starting my car or pushing the brake or pulling it into gear this morning but somehow i got moving in that damn car and i ended up getting to the destination that i wanted to go to and i was present in that moment while i was doing it <clears throat> um yeah, and these this concept of Zen, like for me, it's been through reading and doing martial arts and mostly through talking to Sense of Legacy. Um, so I guess one thing I, I know, I'm going to tell one of Sense of Legacy's stories maybe before he tells it. Um, Sense of Legacy was a custodian in a grade school for a long time before he retired. And a teacher came to him and said about Zen, oh, can you, you're a martial artist, explain to me about Zen and Sensei Legacy said, I can tell you everything about this garbage can. I can answer all, every question you will ever have about this garbage can. And the teacher was like, oh, really? How? And he just pushed the garbage can forward towards them and closed the door in his office and went back inside. The garbage can's there. It gets there. All the answers are right there in front of you. You just have to experience the garbage can. Right? <laughs> and before we move on, Sean, the one thing I guess I would say, another way to think about it is, as martial artists, every one of us on this call has been asked, oh, why do you do martial arts? Uh, what's it like to get punched in the face, right? Like, what does it feel like to get punched in the face? Why did you do that? I haven't done this yet, but I really want to in my life when somebody says, <laughs> what's it like to get punched in the face? I just want to fucking punch them right in the face. And then they'll be Zen right there about a punch in the face. All of the questions will be answered without any words. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that actually reminds me of a podcast I was listening to this morning on the way to see you for some training at like 6 a.m. was um, a, a fellow named uh, Naval Ravikant, who's pretty well known in that sort of self-help. He just said, it's one thing to be able to name a bird, but that gives you no knowledge or experience of the bird. Mm -hmm. You can go, that's a warbler. And it's like, and then walk away and you know nothing other than you know, you know nothing about the bird, you know more about being a scientist than you know about what a bird knows. And I, and I really love that because I think we can get into naming things without any knowledge or experience of them. And one quick question, Sensei, before we move on to Hanshi Legacy, you know, you talked about getting in your car um, and maybe we could end up with each of you addressing this as well. I know I can be very unconscious doing a lot of that stuff. I know I can be thinking of my grocery list and frustrated about work while starting my car. So is there a difference between a Zen state and an unconscious, like extremely unconscious habitual state? Hmm. I think if you're thinking about your grocery list while you're driving the car, then you're not in a state of Zen because you're not present in the moment of what you're doing or just, you know, um, to me, that Zen state of getting in the car is just, I'm not thinking ahead and I'm not thinking behind. I'm just, there isn't really a lot of thought. I'm just putting my shoes on, wandering out to the car. The door opens. Mm -hmm. I get in the car. I drive away. Um, sometimes then you wake up to it and then Zen is gone, right? Like you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm in. But I was doing 75 hard. There's at least five times in 75 hard where I found myself walking down the sidewalk and went, how did I get on the sidewalk? But somehow I got out of bed, got dressed, got my 
vest on and started walking down the street without thinking of any of those things. But I was in the moment. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sensei. I'm going to come back to a big question about that afterwards. But Hanshi Legacy, what is Zen? And do you need to be conscious of the fact that you're on a path? Um, or can you just experience it without ever thinking of the word itself? Well, Zen is really hard to attain. But it, again, like uh, Sensei Burnett is saying, this is very simple. Because um, It's virtually getting rid of oneself because all the senses that we have to see, smell, taste, and everything need to be put aside so that um, a thing can just be what it is. For, for instance, uh, let's take martial arts. If we're going to fight someone, and I often tell my students, empty your mind. Your training is in there. So if I'm set watching Sensei Frenette, what am I thinking? He's going to kick me in the head, right? But if I'm thinking that, my mind isn't empty to react to what's actually going to be happening. You have to virtually get rid of all your senses, stand there in the moment, and have nothing blocking your mind. If you're, if you're thinking, oh, I think I'll punch this guy, the person can kick out your idiosyncrasies of what you do just before you're going to punch and they can pick them up. If your mind is empty, how can they read your mind? Right? So you have to just go in with an empty mind, rely on your training and react to what you've trained. So um, it almost, I'm not going to make this too long, but it almost seems like Getting rid of your senses almost tells you that you're not from this earth. You're from somewhere else. And those senses were given to you in order to cope. Your, you can put your head, your hand, excuse me. You can put your hand on the brain, but you can't touch the mind. And the body is under the ruling of the mind. I learned that from Richard. So it's a, it's very simple, but it's hard to get rid of those senses. You're like, a, for instance, you like ice cream. You like the ladies. You love the taste of this. You like looking at a Corvette. Those things all have to be gone. And this state of mushin, which is empty mindedness, will only, if nothing is there, you can only react to what's happening. Mm. So that's why I teach my students when they fight. They say, okay, what should I do? I have to say, empty your mind. The Mushin concept, it's 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 very interesting. And sometimes, you know, like uh, when I had discussion of it with Sakya Maroshi, we were talking about the concept of the mind, you know, being empty and ready to accept any anything coming at. That's how you, you, you become conscious. And he was explaining that, you know, imagine a, a small pond or a lake it's very still. So that mind is very still. If you throw one rock in it, then the ripple, these mm -hmm. are all the things that you're going to perceive or you're going to catch because you don't have that that uh, intellect interfering. It's all subconscious, which is very still. And that's why that's why you need to get to the level, the, the point of Mushin, which is no mind, you know? And that's why I, I said earlier about Mushin and then Fudoshin. Fudoshin, it's... Fudoshin means unbreakable mind that comes with it. And then from what we do, there's another another term is Kenshin, which is the spirit of the technique. You know, but like I said earlier, all those three has the word Shin, which is the Kokoro, the heart, the spirit, which is very important. And in order to be able to react to what you have to become still, no mind. Then like Sensei Legacy said, if you're fighting or whatever, if you don't think, but you react to what's being given to you, the answer will come out automatically because you, you physically you've been trained to do whatever you have to do. Is it a punch? Is it a kick? Is it just a, a somebody running at you? Whatever that is, you will react to it because you're not thinking. It's not intellect. It's subconscious. Sakya Morishi wrote something very interesting. And he wrote to me. I'll show it to you. I have it here. I just made a little print of it here. 
And that comes from him. It says, Kukoro Tadashikara Zareba. Ken Tadashikara Tsu means if your heart is not right, your art cannot be right. So I find that very, very interesting, you know, and that's also, again, in relation to the term shin, kokoro, your heart, your spirit, you know, so you are 100% in that moment. You're 100% that punch or that kick or not even moving, but you're always 100%. And like, like we said earlier, it sounds simple and it's not simple because it's very hard to let go. You know, people are thinking all the time. You know, there's always a thought. So how you do? How do you chase those thoughts? You know, and it's through exercise, through doing the exercise of meditating and and conditioning yourself to let go, to get to the subconscious level, let go of the intellect. Okay, Richard Kims, I was going to actually use that example, Mizu no Kokuro, yeah. to have your mind like still water. That's right. That's right. I, we go through that. I teach that to my students as well. It's very nice to to hear you use that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, I I uh, back in the seventies I started to go to France to train, and uh, there was this uh, Zen master was Soto Zen, but he was very interesting because he wrote many books. His name is Tyson de Shimaru, de Shimaru, and he wrote a book, a really good book about Zen and martial art, and it's all these you know topics that we're discussing now and then he was always making the the to compare like in japan if you do hikibana like doing floral arrangement you are that you become that you're in that moment if you're cooking you're cooking if you're you know what i mean so that's what that's why you know it's very very omnipresent and 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 the culture in japan the zen concept you know and it's 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 being imported you know over on our side of the world, but uh, the interpretation sometimes may vary, you know, but the idea is to be in the moment here and now, and that's, that's a hundred percent Zen. Can I tell you a really, yeah. uh, a short story? There's a, a Zen master, his name is Tishnat Han. Have you heard him, of him? The name, yeah. Living Buddha, living Christ. Yeah, he, uh, he wrote a book and then and he put a phone number in and they said to call anytime. So I, uh, I called and uh, this person comes to the phone and I said, I would like to speak to Tishnat Han. And he said, oh, uh, you cannot speak to him. I says, why not? And then he said to me, he cannot come to the phone right now. And so, is he already at the phone? Is he the guy who answered the phone? Because <laughs> he can't come now. He's already here. And that was our conversation. Uh -huh. And uh, when I hung up, I, I caught it immediately that I was already speaking to him. So, uh, just something like that. You know, they use stuff like that to see if you're aware. Yeah, for sure. Um, question I want to ask, we'll start with you, Sensei Fernand. Um, th this is something, this is where I'm at in my journey, right? Um, so I'm here to learn where I'm at with my meditations, let's say, is when I have conscious thought, I just go, well, I have the gift of consciousness as a human. And so I allow that thought the same way I would allow an impulse as a reactive person, mm -hmm. time for coffee, time to move out of the way of the train. Time to sit still meditating for half an hour, but still have a ton of thoughts. Who cares? Mm -hmm. So my question is, if we're allowing without judgment, witnessing, observing while meditating, does it actually matter if our mind's clear or can we actually be thinking of other things, but just shrugging because we do have the gift of consciousness? Can that be part of a Zen state? I think it's, it's part of your Zen ev evolution, you know? That in a sense where chasing the thoughts, it's a big struggle. You know, and like you said, you, you you know, you have to create the environment that makes you the most comfortable for one, you know. Now, if you're sitting, if you're doing it like the way we do it in a Zen temple, then you're you're creating that 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 state of of, of wellness in a way. Physically, you're you're good, you're comfortable where you are. And number two, 
the thoughts will come and go, you know, but the way it works in Zen is like, it's not just about not thinking, but it's also, also about your breathing. It's about your posture, you know, like the way you're going to, you know, nobody's like this, tuck your chin in, right? The breathing. So now you start to pay attention to your breathing, to your posture. You know, eventually there's less thoughts coming in because you're focusing on these elements to eventually these are not there anymore. You're just becoming the breath, the breathing, your breath, your inhale and your exhale. And this, this is how, you know, from, from, from training, from sitting, from doing it on, on a regular base, you will get to that, to that level. I would say it's not even a level, but to that state, you know, of letting go, you know, and just becoming one, becoming in that moment, but the breathing and the posture and the, uh, the, the attention in the moment, that's the goal. And by focusing on your breathing, it's going to help already. Just uh, hear your breathing, feel the hair going inside and outside, posture, you know, everything. So once you start focusing on those, the less there's going to be thoughts coming in. So that's usually how, you know, you start building up slowly. And eventually these thoughts will just come in the beginning and then it's just going to disappear and you're just going to become that one, you know, the breathing, the posture, and the attention in the moment. I like to say, so, yeah. no, now, please go ahead. I was going to say, now, it's easier in a way by practicing martial arts because we're like, we're like, we need to move, right? We need, it's hard for us to stand still and not move. That's why I was talking to me and my friends in, in Okinawa and in Japan, and they, they, they know that I've been doing this for since I'm a teenager. And they go, oh, I don't know. I don't know how you do it, John Sun. I don't know. I'm like, why? He goes, ah, I can't. I can't. You know, I can't stand, sit half hour or no an hour. I, say, I can't. I can't. You know, I do it for five minutes, but then after that, I have to move. So the body is made to move, right? But how you control that, that's, a, that's, that's up to you. How are you going to deal with it? But active Zen to me is what I said when we talked the last time, is when you practice and you're in the moment, you know? So sometimes it's, it's that maybe it's to bring your mind to that, those moments where, you know, when you practice, you're the kata, you're, you are the technique, you are in that moment now. Now you have to recreate that sitting and not moving. If it's through breathing, then you can, I think you can achieve this, you know? Yeah, I was just going to say, I really appreciate, thanks for all that, the, um, the earlier thought about not chasing the thoughts. Yeah. To the point where eventually you may not have them. Hanchi Legacy, moving meditation versus seating meditation. He Sensei Frenet just touched on that. Um, where, where do they non, non stationary? Yeah, where do they diverge? What's the difference? I'm sorry, go ahead, finish here. Oh, that's all I was I was asking about. That is, is seated versus non stationary. Um, they're both the same. Uh, non stationary meditation is still um, that's how uh, martial artists are uh, at the beginning. It's like breaking. If you have a lot of thoughts in your mind, you want to get rid of them, only think on one thing. And then you only have that one thing to get rid of. Mm. And we use kata, right? And the best kata person sitting here is probably Setsu Frenet. So um, that is my answer to that. Non-stationary meditation and stationary meditation both serve the same purpose. Mm. Uh, it just... Uh, you can break things down and then all of a sudden, for instance, um, like Randy was saying earlier, you know, have you ever been walking down the street looking at your phone and then all of a sudden you look up and you're there, there and you go, oh, oh, I don't remember getting here. Mm -hmm. that, that is not sta stationary meditation. That just happens by accident. The idea there is to be able to... Uh, control that but not like physical control but just being able to be in that state of motion or empty mindedness mm -hmm. but uh you know like i say like the one thing you're doing is martial arts then you can just get rid of that one thing mm -hmm. you're in a full state um if, if that had all looked rude i was literally just writing down that quote I've never heard you say it that way. If you're having trouble clearing your mind, only think on one thing, then you only have one thing to get rid of. 
That's fucking gold. Thank you for that. Sensei Nofam, moving versus stationary. Well, on that note, <clears throat> in what sense, like he just said, you've, whether you were listening or you heard me um, when I was teaching class, before gradings or tournaments, I often tell students, just focus on one thing. Like, just go in, and it doesn't really matter what it is you're going to focus on. You know, focus on your chamber, like focus on your posture, focus on your breathing and try and carry that one thing through the whole kata. Inevitably, what you find is after you do the first couple of moves, that just disappears mm. out of your brain. And now you're just doing the kata. Whereas when you're like, OK, I have to lift my knee. I have to put my foot down here. I got to get my elbows together. I got to drive my hand down. I got to pull it back. I got to step in and out. I got to crack my hip. I got to. That's not Zen and that's terrible. Uh, but I would say you have to go through that, right? Like you have to go through all those things to be able to let that go. None of us could walk at one point. And now all of us can walk. And when's the last time you thought about standing up and walking across the room? You just can do it, right? You just can do it. Um, I think they're both the same thing. Whether you're moving or whether you're sitting still, it's all Zen. So like, it's all Zen. Like it's, it's a bird is a bird in flight and a bird is a bird on a wire. It's still a bird, no matter, <laughs> no matter. Um, but yeah, I guess I, then the last thing I'll just say about that is what I said before. Everybody has Zen and everybody's experiencing it, whether they define it that way or whether they don't define it that way. It is that. That's what it is. It's that living in the moment. Yeah. Whether, whether you're sitting or kicking or doing a kata, it's the same state of mind. There's no, there's no difference for that matter. That's for sure. But going back to what you were saying earlier, let's say you go, you start from home and you drive and you do your thing and then you get wherever and then you're just like oh shit and you you know i didn't realize i'm already there i use the example like on on a street on your street that you go all the time every day you go through it and then there's no stop at one specific area and then one day they decide to put a stop will you see it and going in that what you're saying earlier you probably won't see it you know why because it's it's automatic it's not even that's not even zen that's like okay i'm going over there and that's like my mind is somewhere else your mind is somewhere else and you're driving and you're going over there and then you know it's like you're on the highway that's i've done so many times uh montreal toronto and then eventually i'm like oh shit i'm in kingston already i'm like what the hell happened you know yeah. <laughs> so it's not because it's zen it's because i'm like you know listening to music and my head is somewhere else and i'm thinking about a whole bunch of things uh, and so I, I, I think that if you have the conscious mind and you're like in the moment all the time and whatever you do, you're hundred percent there, that stuff, you will see it. But if you go and your mind's wandering, big chances that you won't see that stuff. And I've seen it so many times, the things like that, you know? So the awareness of what's around you, when the energy, you, you, eventually you start feeling a lot of things, you know? And that's very interesting. The more you're present in the moment, the more you will feel, you know, what's around you. I have this uh, thing I want to share with you, uh, Sense of Fernet. Sense Legacy and I um, fought literally thousands of hours of fighting, like thousands of hours of fighting. And so many Zen moments came out of that. But there's one in particular that I know Sense of Legacy will remember. It was probably after like 12 or 14 years of fighting. So I had gotten better like than I was in the beginning when he just used to foot sweep me and punch me and beat me up. And uh, But I just remember standing there one day in my fighting stance and looking at him and I only had one thought, you go ahead and move. I didn't have a thought of I'm going to punch. I didn't have a thought of I'm going to kick. I didn't have a thought. I just was standing there looking at him thinking, you go ahead and come to here. And he looked at me for like, three seconds, five seconds, and then he moved away. And then I had to move and then everything changed. And when I looked at him, he said, there was no way in. <laughs> there was no way in, but nothing happened. Nobody said anything. Nobody did anything. 
somehow he could read my readiness and my intention just being in that moment so deeply. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's what it is really. You know, it's interesting. You feel the same thing. You know, let's say you walk in the street, you are really in the moment. You will feel people, and I had that, you know, over over time. You know, people. You see people. You feel them. The energy is is really negative. You you sense the aggressivity that that person is letting out. You know, as they walk, just by the body body language. But that, if you're open, you will you will, you know, capt captivate the not captivate, but uh, sense those those uh, either energies or emotion that are coming out of a person. So same thing in fighting, like you said. You know, you felt that you were there in the moment. Okay, now I got to move, change. We're going to change your mind. Try to, you know what I mean? Strategy, right? In fighting. So, but I think it's, the, you, you'll feel it. If you're in the moment, you will see how you see clearly things around you, you know, versus when your mind is busy with zillions of things because uh, life goes so fast, you know? So we have to, at some point, take a break, stop and breathe and be in the moment. It's a great vacation. Yeah. So actually that goes right to my next question. And um, yeah, the, the idea of the past informing why you can just drive down the street. You've mm -hmm. done it a hundred times. And the idea of a concept of the future, maybe a new stop sign, but give or take, it's going to be the way it was yesterday. Yeah. Maybe it's the way it was last year with snow, but same diff. I get how this road works. Mm -hmm. So do I need to abandon all that knowledge to be in the moment? Or is it because all that knowledge I can be unconscious in the moment? At what point do I function in the real world, so to speak? Or does that not matter for Zen? Because it's actually by, by having a past and a predicted future that I can get around pretty easily unconsciously without having to learn what a stop sign is every day right right totally agree but there's there's no way for you to 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 know what's going to happen if somebody's going to run in the street or you know something's going to pop out of nowhere right so even if you're still going into that mind that we're talking about not seeing the stuff because of new stuff you probably hit that kid too because your mind is not there it's right. somewhere else right so that's the idea now how can you be present but also still living you know like it's not like a and handicap mentally, like in a sense where you can be 100% there and be able to appreciate what's going on. Actually, you'll see more around you when you're present in the moment. And I always say there's a difference between looking and seeing, mm. right? So, but I think that the fact that, you know, when your mind is wandering and you're trusting, you know, all these habits that's been conditioned for years, right? Uh, there's something's going to come out unaware. If you're not, in, if you're not in, in present now, you probably miss out. You know, there's something pop out of nowhere. You probably won't see it, or you will react a little bit too late because you're not in that moment. It doesn't mean that you have to be like this and be stressed. It's not right. Like, like, it's actually <laughs> just be be there. You know, and you know, so it's just that. You know, but like we said earlier, it sounds simple, but it's not that simple. But it's simple in a way. Sure. Um, I won't, we'll end on you, Sensei, for now, but you just said something that I know we've talked about and I think is worth going around on. So we'll start with you, Hanshi Legacy. The difference between looking and seeing. Well, it's what we're talking about right now. If you're looking, you have something in your mind, right? So if something happens, you will notice it later. You won't notice it at its onset. And if you're seeing, you will see it as it happens, right from the onset. If I'm staring down to somebody or just facing an opponent and I'm thinking, oh, he's going to kick or if I'm looking to see where his body's going to move first, all of a sudden he moves. I have to bring my attention to that move. Whereas if I am seeing, I'm seeing the whole body. It's like looking out your windshield. You see everything out there. As soon as something moves, something, say uh, you're looking out in the water and a fish jumps. From stillness comes motion. So you notice the difference instantly. But if you're uh, watching a boat go by and a fish jumps, you, you may see it or you may see it landing 
but you won't get it from the onset. And that gives you an advantage in fighting. As soon as that, that person starts to move, as soon as you recognize what that person is doing, you can do something about it. Otherwise, you know, if you're yeah. looking around, you're expecting a kick, like from um, Master Finette over there, and you're looking at his feet, he'll punch you in the forehead. And it, you'll be worse for the experience. <laughs> so that's why. Mizu no kokuro. Mm -hmm. If the water is all calm, it's easy to see a movement. Mm -hmm. If the water is rough, it's hard to see another movement. Thanks, Anchi. Sensei Dolphin? Yeah, what, sense, what Sensei Legacy said. Yeah, yeah. like, I mean, my short answer is what Sensei Legacy said. But uh, the one uh, you've heard me say too, Sean, which I think is similar is, um, you heard me, but you weren't listening. Right? You heard me, but you weren't listening. I catch the kids coming in the dojo with it all the time. It was March break last week. And as they walked in, I said... Hey, Ivan, how was school today? Fine, Sensei. And I'm like, are you sure? And then he'll look at me. I'm like, there was no school today. You heard me, but you weren't listening to me. You didn't go to school today. Right? So it's the same kind of thing from nothing, right? But are you present? Are yeah. you are you present or are you not present? Mm -hmm. True. Um, so you can either go into uh, a new idea, Sensei, for Nat, or if you want to put a button on the seeing versus looking, it's up to you. Yeah, actually, the Sakyamaru, she said one thing, because I was the only uh, gaijin in the temple over there for, for many years. And eventually, Sakyamaru, she gave me his personal kimono. And it was, he did a ceremony called Ishin Den Shin, from my spirit to your spirit, from my heart to your heart. And some people were a bit uh, not not necessarily happy about that, or... Did not understand. And then there was one thing at the end of that that Sunday morning after tea ceremony and Zen Mundo discussion. Because Zen Rinzai is, is very much oriented on the Kohan. And as he will give you a Kohan. And then you might have to think about this for one year before you come back with some answer. So he, he leaves you with something, right? And what he did that day, and it was a kind of a message because he sensed, you know, some people were like, why this him, right? And he says, see things as they are see things as they are so and then 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 it came to me it came like okay I, I, there's a message there for sure you know it's not just about me but it's it's overall you know what do you see when you see somebody are you seeing the envelope or you're seeing that soul that person what do you what mm -hmm. what do you feel from that person it goes beyond the uh intellect or the um the judgment you know or the whatever we have the standards in society. Oh, he's wearing black shoes, or he's, you know what I mean. Like a lot of people, uh, they will they will make their opinion on somebody by the way they dress and what car they drive and you know whatever, right? But I think that again, true Zen, and then the here and now, when you look at somebody, what do you see? Mm. And it's and and you can see through. You know, when you're in that moment, you can see that person. And that's why I'm saying many times, if you're in that moment present, you will feel the people's energy. You will feel people's intention you know it's going to come to you if it's directed towards you you will feel it if it's not towards you it's it's just going to go but here and now it's so important you know that reminds me of a george bernard shaw the playwright quote which is the only person who treats me sensibly is my tailor he measures me new every time we meet mm -hmm. and uh, it's, <laughs> yeah and yeah. it doesn't mean he forgets yeah. that he knew you before but it's how are you now Mm -hmm. exactly exactly yeah um i just want to throw out an idea and then ask you another question about the history but eckhart tolle one of my favorite spiritual authors and a given sense he don't the book he has an exercise he likes to do where just look at a plate but forget you know it's a plate and mm -hmm. just see it and um and and what does it look like in three dimensions what does it look what is the light doing on it mm -hmm. and um i wonder what you think of that type of exercise to distance ourselves from what we know and actually let things be what they are. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting exercise because, again, your mind can play some tricks on you if you start to think and try to imagine things versus 
looking at whatever you're looking at or imagine something and how it's going to take shape is it will have to do a lot with your state of mind when you're doing that kind of exercise which is fine because then it gives you a pulse or how you are today and where you are you know what i mean so it's 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 very interesting how the mind is going to is going to express itself you know through that vision or whatever you see or you can imagine in front of you you know which is you know very interesting um, it's almost like the plates reflecting back you yeah. get to watch yourself anew that day. That's it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the history. I mean, um, I know there's one idea I've heard in my time in the martial arts that maybe there wasn't that much Zen in the martial arts as a conscious thing because it really was life or death before a certain point. And it was only maybe after the Meiji Restoration or, you know, when soldiers weren't killing in that way that they needed a place to put their mind um where do you see zen consciously partnering with the martial arts as opposed to always being there which we know is true yeah uh you know i think that the fact that you know the you know you look from okinawa you know where they developed the art of of defending himself on the island that was strictly to defend themselves right even with the chinese influence and other countries around influence as opposed to, let's say, Japan, who took karate and made it their own, made their own version in mainland Japan, but also Japan had a strong culture with Buddhism and Shintoism and you know Zen. So they that kind of went together. You know, they kind of put it together more. You know, uh, so I'd, I'd say that the biggest influence of bringing the the two concepts together comes a lot from from Japan, from the culture of Japan. Right on, um, Hanshi Legacy. Is there anything you want to add to that? when Zen became consciously part of it? Well, you, you would be surprised to find out who originally made up the 10 exercises, which were not quite in the, the warrior form, was Buddha. Mm -hmm. Buddha found his monks to be all fat, and he gave them uh, 10 major muscle group exercises. And when... Uh, the 38th Dharma Taishi walked over to him in the mountains and went into the Shaolin temple. He brought those with him. And then they came out of the Shaolin into Okinawa, let's say Supernet was saying. But most people are shocked to find out that mm -hmm. the fire lit under martial arts came from Buddha. So it's always been there. It's always been there, that's for sure. Yeah. Sensei Dofa, I'm not helping you by putting you after your sensei, but anything you want to add? No, it's just always been there. Like, I think, uh, unless you're like, unless you're a martial artist who've been entrenched in this for a good portion of your life, or you're a martial artist like um, Sensei Fernet, who's been to Japan and actually trained in Zen temples, like in Seiza, not necessarily just um, non stationary meditation. I stand to be corrected on this, but in uh, specifically in Japan, Zen is in everything. Like your body, mind, and spirit goes with you everywhere. The concept that we have here in North America of I go to school to be educated, I go to the church for religion, and I go to uh, the gym to work on my body, that's not the same in Japan. They bring their body, mind, and spirit to the gym. They bring their body, mind, and spirit to school, and they bring their body, mind, and spirit to the temple you're never like just training one thing when you go to those things. You're training all of those things. Since the Fernet already talked about it, posture is training your body. Sitting properly is training your body to behave in a proper way. Breathing properly is a physical activity. That's not like you have to, your diaphragm has to move. Air has to come in through your nose. It has to go down. Mm -hmm. It's always been there. It's always been a part of it. And it always will be, whether you want it to or whether you don't. It's unarguable. It's an unarguable, like, I would challenge somebody to come and say that Zen didn't exist in martial arts before. Yeah. Or in eating dinner. Yeah. Or in reading a book or in anything. I would challenge anybody to say that it, it wasn't there. It's always been there. In my um, dojo, I, I have a small sign that says, this is a pure and holy place. And most people won't get that. They'll just think it's, it's above fighting. 
but it's not. It's the entire being. Mm. Um, Sensei Dauphin, I think you had a question, yeah, that you you or a thought you wanted to provoke. Well, just one, uh, just any <laughs> examples that any any of you want to share of moments of Zen in your life. So, for example, me. One that I can think of, like a very uh, early one, would be as a green belt competing in the Ontario Championships, and I think I came in third in kata. And but when I came out of the ring, people were like patting me on the back. Like Al Menesis was like, "That's the most incredible kata you ever did." Like that's it, crazy. And I was like, "Really? I feel like I forgot half of it. Like mm. I don't, I don't feel like I actually like." did it like I knew I punched and that's the only thought I had was just do nice punches as you do this and through the years that's always stuck with me that um I was very detached from the referees I was aware they were there but their opinions didn't matter I was very detached from the people standing around the outside I was very aware that they were there but I wasn't allowing that to influence what I was going to do when I went into the ring and to me that was one of my the first gleams of Zen starting to appear in a, it's going to sound, this is a blasphemy, appearing in a very conscious way in my life. Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I just wonder like, and I'll go to you first, Sean, like, um, you know, you have any moments of Zen that you can think of in your past or even recently? Actually, well, I've got so many that do have to do with fighting, car racing, uh, motorcycle where a car just, loses a tire right in front of me and the reactions conscious present it's like it's unfolding in slow motion and everything ends up fine um i could i could cite a hundred of those but if i had to say where 99 of them are it's motorcycle fighting car on the track or quick thing but i will tell you this one and it sounds almost like it's it's a, it's a movie script and i don't mean to make it cinematic it's just quietly true i was in kyoto with my my last girlfriend and we were up at a monastery and I just said, I'd like to meditate for a moment. And she's like, great. Like, yeah. So we knelt down and I closed my eyes and started breathing and clearing my mind. And I don't know what happened, but I time warped something. I just opened my eyes and she was looking at me. I said, what's going on? She has, she, she said to me, she goes, I have no idea. I have no idea what's going on. We stood up and we walked out and the light, I mean, it was a different time of day. And I said, I don't, how long were we in there? She goes, I don't know. Cause neither of us had a watch or a phone. We were in Kyoto. We'd, I, I believe we were in there for maybe an hour. I don't know. It was bonkers. And it's one of the purest meditative experiences. The fact it was in Kyoto is why it feels almost made up, but I, I it changed me that day and I've never meditated the same since. So it was that's as pure a Zen moment as I've had, and it was stationary. Amazing. Mm. So it's a legacy. What moments or moment do on you have? On the lighter side, I don't I don't think that Sensei Burnett has ever experienced a third place in cotton. Not <laughs> 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 Okay. And uh, just to to come back full circle, I remember standing in front of a guy once, and I was going to attack him, but I, I saw him move. So I just turned around and walked away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. One for you guys. Like like Sean, at many, many moments like that in life where it's a near miss type of thing, you know, where you're so in the moment that you see things happening in slow motion and you, you know, you don't need, you don't think you just react, but you see it. Everything is there. Right. But it's something that, that, that made history afterwards. And you'll understand why I'm in Germany in 1987 in Munich at the world championship. And I win. Now I got all my big rivals are there like John Chong and everybody else. Right. So obviously you could have the ego as big as the planet, you know, when you win something like that, I go back to my hotel and I got the big cup and I was the competitor of the world champ, whatever. I had some couple of words, right? So I put it on the table. I'm in my hotel room and I, I look at myself in the mirror and I'm, I'm like, so what? What's the difference now? What's different, right? 
There's nothing different, right? I'm the same guy. So it comes back to what we were saying earlier. Then push forward. I'm with Sakya Marushi, and I explain to him the same thing. And then he goes, oh, that is Zen. And then what he did is in his last book that he wrote, he wrote a chapter about me, but it's called So What? So that was the thing about, you know, all these things, right, are happening, and you could be like this big of a head, and you look at self, look at yourself in the mirror goes, so what? Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed, you know? So that's Zen too, you know? So that's, uh, that's it's very interesting how... Uh, it comes to us, you know, and then there's a revelation sometime and you don't, you don't think, but it, you know, it, it happens. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have four minutes left. So Sensei Dolphin, I'd love to hear your thought on your pure Zen moment and then your wrap up thought for the show. And then we'll go Hanshi Legacy and last word to Sensei Fernet. Listen, I'm not going to give that thought. I'm just going to share something because you talked about Kyoto and I've told this story before and people I don't know if it's a Japan temple thing. Uh, I know since Frenette and I, he asked me a question once. He It was on his PKCC. He said, Randy, you like Japanese food, right? And I said, yes. And he said, did you always like Japanese food? And I said, yeah. Then he said, even before you went to Japan, I was like, yeah, like I just always liked it, right? So we, we had this, I don't know why that is. I'm just going to let that sit how it is, but I'm going to share this with you, Sean. Um, Two times ago when I was in Japan, I went to Meiji Temple. And if you've never been to Meiji Temple, it's a long walk from the subway station to get to the actual temple. Like you got to, it's a couple kilometers. To, it's almost like walking through Central Park, but nicer. And I was limping like crazy. I had hurt my, my butt cheek. I hurt it really bad. My gluteus maximus um, training the, the day before. And Suino said, to said, Randy, you should maybe go back to the hotel. And I just said, Sensei, listen, like, this is going to hurt the whole time I'm in Japan. I'm not going to lose my experience of being in Japan. So I limped to the temple. And I, then I thought, oh, I'm going to do a prayer. And I washed my hands and I washed my mouth and I walked up and I did the clapping and I bowed and I threw my coins in. And literally, I'm not making this up. I said, whoever's out there, please let my ass stop fucking hurting. And then I <laughs> bowed again and I clapped <laughs> and I turned around and I didn't think about it really. So I said, Sweeno did his prayer. I don't know what he prayed for. And then as we left the temple, maybe about 20 minutes later, walking out to the subway station, Sweeno said, Randy, you're not limping anymore. And I was like, I'm not limping anymore. And my ass was fine. And it didn't hurt for the rest of the, the trip. It was totally fine. <laughs> so I don't know. You explain that. I know. Hunchy Fernet has thoughts on it right now. He has reasons why, but that'll be another hour. But that's what I want to share with you, Sean, about my moment of Zen in Japan. Thanks, Sensei Dofa. Hanchi Legacy, um, last thoughts for our chat with Sensei Fernet before we give uh, Sensei Fernet before we give him the last word. Oh, just a pleasure seeing you again. We've known each other since the beginning of our karate, yeah. our martial arts, right? Yeah. Oh. He is always a guy that if you have the opportunity to see The Eye of the Tiger with uh, Jean Frenet, look at it on YouTube. I was there. I watched him come out with that. And that's why I didn't do Kata, because of guys like him. He, he's <laughs> one of the greats. And that's the truth. I was just lucky in fighting. I was never lucky in Kata. <laughs> My pleasure to see you again, sir. Same, same, same. Nice to see you. Yeah. Definitely. What I mean. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Maybe, huh? I was Levy. Right. <laughs> maybe next topic, maybe we can talk about reincarnation, past life, previous life, deja vu. Yes, please. Oh, could I be interesting. I'm yeah. ready for that. Yeah. I would love that conversation. Um, Sensei, thank you so much. And I just want to say if you have teachers out there and chatting with them doesn't make you like need to go try the stuff you're talking about find another teacher because i'm so excited to wake up and meditate tomorrow morning i'm so excited to hit the gym and do my kata after what we talked about one thing in my mind till there's no thing in my mind please find yourself teachers and guests teachers for the night who uh stimulate you in a way that you cannot wait to just go keep going with the thing they're showing you thank you senses thank you guys thank you
Yeah, I will say thanks so much, uh, Sensei Fernet. I'm really, really proud to be your friend now and be connected to you. Um, I'm really proud that my, like, as I said, my wife, my my children know you. They all speak fondly of you and like you. They're excited to see you. They'll hug you when they see you. I can't wait to see you again. I hope it's in Levy. If not, it'll be in Ottawa. But mm -hmm. it's very comforting to know that we are connected in a way that um, I would never, I, you're the type of a person, to quote Rick Joslin, said to Joslin, you're the type of person that I would walk across the street to say hello to and give a hug to and and talk to. And uh, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And like I said, for me, it's it's a delight, you know, when I when we get to talk and go deeper in some discussion, but also every time that we see each other and we talk, we get to know each other more, which I love very much. So, you know, it's a real friendship. I really, uh, really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for watching, everybody. Hit that subscribe, that like button, and we'll see you for future live and short episodes. Thanks hey. for watching Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. All right. See you. Salut. Ah, salut. <laughs>